Welcome back. The Jacob Fusberg Law Firm focuses on fighting for the rights of those who have been placed in vulnerable positions and in our need of legal support. The attorneys have experience in advocating for cases pertaining to birth injuries, civil rights violations, product liability, and much more. Joining us to tell us more are managing partners at Jacob Fusberg Law, Alan Fusberg and Eli Fusberg. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Good morning, Veronica. Thank you for having us. Yes, we're going to be covering some Good important morning. topics. Good morning. So I want to start off with um, the prison abuse. I think many people believe that when you're in prison, you lose your rights. And so I just want to talk about that um, uh, first. Um, do you lose your rights as a prisoner when you go to jail? You definitely lose your rights as an, as an independent person. You're obviously being confined in prison, but our Eighth Amendment protects us of the United States Constitution as well as the New York State Constitution against cruel and unusual punishment. And therefore, just because you're in prison doesn't mean everything about your human dignity and your safety should be taken away and that you're not entitled to those protections. And so what we began to realize in our field of medical malpractice is some people were being treated with deliberate indifference in prison with serious medical problems such as a, a something with their spine, a cyst on their spine that wasn't treated so they became paralyzed or a woman who was having a vision problem and she actually went to an eye doctor and they said bring her back and they never brought her back and she lost her vision wow. and it was treatable. And that deliberate indifference is, is equivalent to cruel and unusual treatment, punishment, and you're entitled, uh, you have a constitutional right, and we bring these cases in federal court. There is also the issue of solitary confinement, and in fact, even this year, uh, fortunately, uh, the, the governor limited how long you can be in solitary confinement at one time to 30 days, but that's even too long. What was the long. reason behind that? What was the reason? The reason was, for example, we represent people who've been in solitary confinement for 270 days because the prison facility, the correction officers, the administration did not like the person. The person was advocating for a lot of prisoners. They were creating problems for the prison, mm -hmm. but not by breaking any rules, but advocating for rights. And they act actually, mm -hmm. under, under pretext, mm -hmm. found that the prisoner had done things that deserve punishment. Uh, but to put somebody in solitary, first of all, it was wrong. And in fact, a court has actually ruled that the reasons they put the person in punishment in, in solitary confinement was pretext. But aside from the fact, even if you need to do that sometimes because a prisoner is violent or dangerous, you have to always take into consideration the prisoner as well as the general population. And they're also trying to restrict it now and not use solitary confinement for people that are not don't endanger others. So if you're going to punish something, and I think of our children, we might tell them to go sit in a corner for an hour. But there's a big difference between telling someone to sit in the corner for an hour and putting them in solitary confinement for, for months. months. Yes. It's awful. And, and it can, destroys a person. Of course. I can imagine the mental health toll that it takes on a person. And then you also advocate for the mental health awareness for prisoners as well. Correct. So talk about the Freedom of Information Act. We've just talked about the coronavirus. Are they receiving the information that they should? The public is getting um, oh, you know, all these rules as to what they should be doing to minimize the virus from spreading. Are they still getting this information that they need? If you could just explain a little more about that act. Sure. Uh, the Freedom of Information law in New York is very strong. Uh, it favors disclosure, except under certain circumstances. Um, so, I mean, we've seen it in other cases where we've handled involving, uh, for instance, a hospital that had Legionnaire's disease, where we wanted uh, this information that needs to be reported to New York State. Uh, and so we requested this information and they denied it. Um, and we were able to fight and, and, and to get this information that's important. You know, we think, and that's what the government thinks, is that, you know, individuals have a right to know this information. 
um, to be to be able to make the the best decisions for them, and you know to contain this information, you know, is, is not right. Um, I think there's a famous quote by Judge Brandeis that says sometimes the best disinfect disinfectant is sunlight, mm. and so you know I think that this information should be available to the public, and obviously that's a fight that we're going to be seeing uh, now involving the coronavirus. I can just imagine. I mean, all these supplies are being limited to us here, out here. I mean, uh, the, the hand sanitizers and the antibacterial wipes. I mean, do we think that they're being provided in the prisons? Are they allowing them to well, consistently wash their you hands? Know, are they providing? I hope so. I mean, that's sanitizers? a good example. That's a good example of what of whether you're in prison or not, you're entitled to the same humane care. That's not what it's about. Your movement may be confined. But your right to be treated humanely is is equivalent, and hopefully that's happening. But also, uh, to add on to what Eli's saying, politics get in the way. So our legislator has passed our right to know under the Freedom of Information Act, but then we get pushback when we request these documents. Often we're trying to get prison records and find out what happened with an incident. Uh, sometimes we, we have a case where somebody had Legionnaire's disease in a hospital, and there were very many other cases, and we wanted to get that information mm -hmm. from the government, and they were not giving it to us. They were resisting giving it to us. We had to get a, a court order that said that we're entitled to that information unless they have a, a darn good reason not to give it to us. I think of the government administration being slow, so slow on getting on top of our concerns about the coronavirus and why there aren't enough test kits because mm -hmm. the government was so slow. And it has to do with politicians thinking they know what's better for us than we know by the public insisting on, on performance, and we can only do that if we have the information. So, how does a prisoner get in touch with you to get these, uh, can, to get their rights advocated for? I can imagine, like, it, you know, they don't have the money to pay for the services. So, like, how do they uh, obtain the services from you all, from the law firm? Uh, well, we do. We we represent people on a contingency basis, and also under under the civil rights laws, we are entitled to if we believe the case has merit to receive attorney's fees. And prisoners do have access to making telephone calls to lawyers, and those calls can be set up. And they often communicate with family members who give us a little information in advance, and then we set up uh, these phone calls, and we can be on the phone for as long as an hour so we can get a good detail. Then we go and we get all the records. Yes. And thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, we're entitled to that. Also, all prisoners are entitled to their medical records, just like anyone else is entitled to their medical records from any hospital or any medical facility at any time. You're entitled to request your medical records. We have to go soon, but I just want to also touch on um, you've been helping women who have had cases of their children being born with birth defects. If you could just quickly just tell us a little bit about that and how you're helping these moms. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible what happens with these catastrophically injured uh, babies. Um, I mean, often what happens is uh, the most common case we see, uh, it's called uh, HIE, uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, where a baby just isn't getting enough oxygen and needs to be delivered more timely. And even though they're, they're monitoring this mother, um, you know, they're not inducing the labor and they're not performing cesarean section to get this baby out of this hostile uterine environment. And what happens is they have brain damage, and they, you know, they have there's catastrophic results for the rest of the infant's life. I mean, a big issue, um, you know, that that we're seeing a lot is residents providing a lot of this care, a lot of this monitoring. And what happens is you have a lot of these big hospitals uh, that then purchase these smaller satellite hospitals, and they're not properly staffing and properly funding these smaller satellite hospitals. Mm -hmm. And so the doctor will have to go from the main campus to the satellite hospital. And meanwhile, these patients aren't being properly monitored, and, and what happens is this baby isn't getting enough oxygen and has brain damage that, that's permanent, that's what, gonna... What advice can we give to parents to make, sure, to, to make sure that this doesn't happen? Like, what's the research that should be done? Advocacy. Yeah. Uh, do, if you're feeling something, speak out. Mm -hmm. If you want to talk to, if you're not happy with what the doctor in the room is saying to you or the nurse, say, I want to talk to somebody else. Speak out when your health is at stake, speak out, or, or somebody in your family. If you feel they're not being 
nobody's paying attention, your baby needs to come out, whatever, whatever is going on, your intuition is very often correct, particularly when it comes to you. Advocate for yourself. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with us. Great information. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for having us. For thank more you. information, you can visit their website at fixburg.com. You can also visit their Instagram at Fusberg Law Firm or on Facebook at Fusberg Law. Don't go anywhere because when we come back, we'll learn how one company is helping underrepresented employees. Stay tuned.